Hi everyone, I just released a new tutorial video, Secrets of Shading. This video is five hours of lecture and demonstration explaining the basic concepts you need to understand in order to render complex organic forms. Throughout it, I try to emphasize the importance of thinking of shading as drawing on the inside instead of a vague step where you throw ambiguous shadows all over your line drawing. What you see on the screen are all nine chapters running at once, just to give you an idea of what to expect. If you want to pick it up, check out the link in the description. And now, onto a free preview chapter. I picked this one because I cover a favorite topic, the contrast hierarchy. And if you want a discount on this tutorial video and future tutorial videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. Enjoy! Okay, so let's repeat the exercise from the last video, but uh, we're on a slightly nicer paper here so we can talk about um, doing a little more work in the light, maybe do a little more racing. We'll just get some crisper lines. So let's, um, I wind up doing this stuff all the time in my drawings, but um, you can think of this sort of as like you're designing tentacles. I think that's a good way to think of it. Uh, there's nothing really concrete about a tentacle, but it still feels vaguely anatomical. So as you saw here, just through a basic gesture, filled it with some forceful direction-filled balloony shapes. And now, just like we did in the previous exercise, I'm going to pick some shadow shapes. So designing this. A lot of beginners, when they start putting their shadow shapes onto a form, they sort of, um, they forget, they tend to forget that everything that you put down into a drawing, you need to draw it and design it and give, us, give it as much thought as any other part of the drawing. Uh, when we're starting out, we tend to think that, um, it's a little difficult to put in the words into words, but we tend to feel or think like the only thing we really need to draw is, for example, the face, like the thing of substance, the, uh, the object, the concept that we can really grasp onto the thing that we're used to thinking about. We think I draw the face, I design the face, and I need to make the face look good. And when we do the shadows or something like that, we just kind of devolve into this more abstract thinking that tends to forget that every aspect of the drawing needs to be designed and interesting on its own. So you can see this pass that I'm taking here at the shadows, I am drawing this shadow shape, which is all interconnected on this tentacle, let me exaggerate it here. Look at the variety that I'm seeking here, right? So long tapering teardrop slashes to this part of the shadow, then these repeated smaller bulgy parts, then a bigger curve into a straight, and then a really big curve there that will become a soft gradient in the render. This shadow shape on its own has its own character. It is exciting. You could cut it out and just uh, just look at the shadow shape on its own. Well, maybe let's not go that far. It's not a, it could go that far. Certain artists really do um, get shadow shapes that are so interesting on their own that really you could take out everything else in the picture and it holds up. An example might be like uh, Mike Mignola. His, uh, his comic book style is based entirely on the shadow shapes and you could really just simplify them down to a, a perfect bitmap where it's like it's either black or white with no gradation and his drawings would still have all the same impact. And in fact, many of them might look exactly the same because he uh, plays entirely in the realm of two values of shadow shape versus light shape. So you don't have to wind up going in that direction with your art but this base situation, the base concept of the light shape versus the shadow shape is everything. And this is a great exercise. I don't know what to call this exercise. The tentacle exercise, the meat spear exercise, the meat ball exercise, the uh, grown in a vat piece of alien biology exercise. Just, you don't need to, you wanna turn off the part of your brain that is thinking about arm, bicep, hand, just briefly, and practice this concept on its own to build an intuition for just designing interesting 
shadow shapes, interesting interactions. When I say an interesting shadow shape, what we're really talking about is when you design an interesting shadow shape, you are designing an interesting interaction between light and dark, between light and shadow. Okay, so let's say that that's the base that we choose. One thing that you can do after you have your base is a uh, lighten down or rub down, lighten up any of the excess work that you have in the light just to save you some values. You know, it can still leave some indication so I can follow it as I go up into those areas. And then what I like to do is I like to do a little bit of hatching. So if you're not familiar with the idea of hatching, it's just uh, lines generally evenly spaced on your drawing that create a value, right? So you can do single direction or you can do cross hatching, which you've probably heard of and seen a lot in very graphic looking work. And you can cross as many times as you want till eventually the lines kind of blur together and there's no way to differentiate them. But I like to use hatching at this stage uh, even if I'm going to smooth this drawing completely, even if I wind up glassing the surface and just having it have no visible pencil strokes, I will usually use hatch marks early on to give me an indication of the length of the half tone rolls out of the shadow. So if we imagine the light source coming from top here, which has been pretty typical for us throughout these demos, we can imagine this part where we have this big teardrop shape. We can imagine if a light photon was passing in front of it down to here, that this whole area might basically be getting just barely grazed by the light, right? We can see how almost vertical it is there on the edge. So that shape could be just barely getting grazed. So we know it's in like danger of becoming ha of becoming true shadow, of dipping behind the core shadow. And most likely it has a lot of half tone. So in that area, and I do this when I'm sketching on my, you know, on my real drawings all the time, I will roll out of the shadow with some simplified hatching just to indicate to me the length of that half tone roll. So those are pretty long hatch lines that are shorthand that say, when you come out of this core shadow, you're gonna make a nice soft gradation, as opposed to an area like maybe this up here, where the form is smaller and more getting slammed perpendicularly by the light, that really would have a pretty tight roll. So the hatching there would be subtle if I decide to pass my shorthand on it. But um, usually when my drawings are in the middle stage, they look something like this. It's the hat, it's the shadow shape, pretty clearly understood uh, on a good day. Um, I don't always flat it in like this. Often I will just like scry the interesting uh, outline of the edge. And then I'll be like, all right, I don't need to flat this right now. I'll come back later and flat it as I render, right? But I'll at least like figure out the interactions of the light, the interaction of the light and shadow. And then at especially tricky spots like this, I will just indicate for myself the variety in the rolls. So as we've discussed, this hatching is basically doing the work of giving me a shorthand as I sketch for the variety in the edges rolling out of the shadow. If you really wanna get a very flat shadow, like you might see in like a beautiful academic life drawing or something of those sorts, all it really takes is time, you know? Here's the basic method. You pick a small spot, maybe that big, in the shadow and you commit yourself and you say, I'm not leaving here until it's completely flat. So you come in with the pencil sort of at a low angle to the paper like this first. And you use that to lay in the patch and you go carefully. You just try to control the value, look for where it seems inconsistent and then darken or pull back as is appropriate. And then it takes longer than that to do for real, but let's say you spent a good while there flatting, maybe a few minutes. You uh, now crank your pencil up to be more perpendicular to the paper. And then that lets it squeeze into the, uh, the fibers of the paper a little better. 
and you look for the specific white dots that are left over from the texture of the paper. And with the pencil more upright, you just kind of hit those. That lets you fill them in because you're attacking them with more precision and more perpendicular. And then that takes a while. And then inevitably that produces problems. And by problems, I do mean flecks, like dark spots in the shadow, little spots that are darker than others. And then all you do is um, take a kneaded eraser and you draw it out to a little point like that. Or if you do happen to have a super small eraser or one of those erasers that are shaped like a pencil so you can sharpen it, you can use that too. But a kneaded eraser is very easy to drag out into a tiny point. You take the kneaded eraser and then you just attack each one of those little dots in the shadow that is too dark. And that, with enough time, is the method for getting a completely flat one value shadow that looks just beautiful on a finished drawing. And the problem is that a shadow this size to get truly flat, uh, it might take you realistically somewhere between an hour and two hours. It's a extremely labor intensive work. Um, I was taught how to do it at an atelier years ago. It works. Uh, in the class, I, in the drawing I did in that workshop, I flatted the shadows and the effect is very nice, but um, I can do a, I can do a, I can do basically a whole sketch that gets out a completely new idea in two hours. So I don't really do it anymore. It just takes way too long. But uh, just for the sake of completion, that is a part of shading and uh, that is the method. It's just go slow at a low angle, go slow at a high angle and then take your eraser and pick out the dark spots and go back and forth, back and forth for a very long time. And that will flat any value eventually. So I'm just going to also give myself some indications in the light now before I start shading out. So the same idea, longer hatches mean a more gentle gradient, tighter hatches mean a sharper gradient. They're just being indicated in the light shape now. And as we showed in the other demo, it's all just interlocking, almost like balloon or muscle shapes. Then we take our little stump here, and we're just going to, actually, because I used, because <clears throat> I made bigger um, hatch lines here, uh, before I go in and render this spot, I would fill in the spaces by hand with my pencil, just so that when I smudge things, it disappears better. Then I will come in here and grade eight out with the blender. Now remember, when you're doing this, you're always drawing. Do not forget that you are drawing. So I'm following the form. And down here at the core shadow, I wish I could just put my hand on your hand and show you. I am pressing super hard right here. I am like really trying to murder my paper down where the half tone goes into the core shadow. I am bearing down on it. This is why you want to use good paper whenever you're doing something that you want to shade. So the, the glint from the graphite might give it away from you, but might give it away to you on camera. But in person, looking at it at a, at a different angle where there's no glare, um, by pressing super hard, I have really obfuscated the transition between the core shadow and the half tone, and that is realistic to what these situations are like in real life on a real form. You know there is a concrete point where the shadow begins, but the value change between that concrete point, the terminator, and the darkest half tone, the change is so low contrast, barely any modulation in value that you essentially cannot tell where it is. So that's what I'm trying to replicate there. And on good paper, you can really just obliterate um, lines of almost any intensity that you put down if you bear down hard enough with the stump. Most people are very precious with their drawings, so they never realize that that can happen because they're unwilling to press that hard on their paper. It just feels wrong to uh, abuse 
your precious drawing so much, but um, it's one of the fastest ways to just get things to soften up. So yeah, I am oh, absolutely crucifying this third with my stone. And you can see that even those thick, broad textured lines that I put down over here will run together into a generalized patch. On cheap paper, that will destroy the paper, but on decent paper, you can, uh, uh, you can abuse the paper and knock the grain down really far, and then you can still go in. And you can see there, even on that part of the paper that I pressed as hard as I could, uh, I can still get clear hatch lines over that on a second pass. So I'm bearing down pretty hard on those core shadows. And if it looks like they're not like fading away, they're not sort of being obliterated, that is okay because um, in this first part of the shading pass, they, uh, they look very high contrast because you haven't done a bunch of work everywhere else. Like once you start uh, putting details into the lights, all that stuff will become, will look much less low, will look much more low contrast because you're swiping value range up on the light side. So here's something else that I like to do with the stump um, kind of early on is I'll go over the form and make these sort of ringlets that follow the three-dimensional shape. They look very high contrast now, like I said, because there's no work anywhere else, but they eventually disappear as you work into the light more but they do give, I think, they give a subtle effect in the viewer's eye of um, the form rolling around in space in the direction that it's oriented. So, you know, this is a tentacle, it's an ellipse. So if I draw a spiral, if I imagine drawing a spiral that goes in that direction, you know, we're kind of looking down it and it's moving away. So I'm just going in that direction around the form. So you can see pretty quickly, I've grayed the light and I've lost contrast between the light and shadow. So this stuff is starting to soften down. I'm letting this fade off more into darkness as it rolls away because it's so, so like gray, getting grazed by the light. And then that'll make the light, the light area feel, the true light up here feel much lighter this has this soft roll out into darkness. And pressing pretty hard to obliterate stuff there. And then that would be perhaps a decent base for this. Now I'll take a medium hardness pencil as we did on the last demo and I'll start opening up a little work in the light. So if I'm stumping pretty heavily, I will hatch a lot of this work just to get some directionality and bold shapes. And I don't have to worry much about the finish on that hatching. That is to say, you know, organizing it beautifully and getting things really evenly spaced and all that because I know I'm going to beat it up. So I'm going to try to put a subform, that is to say a smaller form that sits on a bigger form into this delicate rolling area. That bubble there, that extra bubble is happening on this form that's really rolling away quite a lot. So it needs to get a pretty significant shadow, as you can see that I've sketched in there, but the trick is to um, get the shadow to be big enough and prominent enough that it feels like a, a, a bulbous shape that is getting grazed by the light, but then make sure that it doesn't get as dark as this stuff so that it sits properly into the contrast hierarchy. It's not darker than something that really should be rolling away even more than it is. 
So I'll take the stump and soften down some of the effects that I got here. And then at this point, I like to take the kneaded eraser or a sharp eraser. I like to take the kneaded eraser or a sharp eraser and start dropping some little indications of highlights or let's say, uh, to use uh, the vocabulary we were using before, like main lights, center lights. So I'm just opening up the compressed light areas of those muscle bellies. And actually this looks good shiny because it feels like a tentacle. And we're just used to seeing like aquatic tentacle shapes being shiny because they're kind of filmy. But um, when I do this, I will generally drop these lights onto the peaks of forms and onto the valleys of forms. You can see I'm running it between the shapes as well. And the reason for that, which we did not get to cover on the uh, sphere demo, is if you imagine, let's say, two lumps on a table with a little valley in between, we know from the sphere light hits it here and then this top form of the lump is most perpendicular to the light so it's going to look lightest right same over here but what else has the exact same orientation to the light as that top and that top that's right down here in the valley the valley is dipping in but it has the same orientation at some point it becomes almost perpendicular to the light so generally, highlights actually happen. Uh, the old phrase, I don't know if it's old, but the phrase that I've heard is in the hills and valleys. And remember, we're using highlights here to mean not the specular reflection. So not the super shiny billiard ball reflection, but just the lightest part on the form if it was made of rubber. Take a sharp eraser. And I'll just kind of, this generally looks, you have to be more judicious with this if you're putting it on a human, for example, because it makes them look all poppy and weird. It gets too high contrast generally, but on a gross thing like this, it kind of works. So I'm just going wherever there's a hill, I'm putting a little bit of light and wherever there's a valley, I'm putting a little bit of light. And that gives us a nice stair-stepping sequence of contrast. So I think you can see here that these concepts are really all that smooth or or um, or realistic looking shading is made of, right? Um, it's just getting good shadow shapes, getting good light shapes, and designing a variety of interact a variety of interactions between them, and then respecting the contrast hierarchy. Um, and that contrast hierarchy on forms like this is pretty simple, as we've discussed. So let's just write it out. So we, we can call it the contrast uh, priorities. So for shading that is pretty formy like this, the contrast priorities generally are number one most important is where light meets shadow. I tend to think of number two as um, attention grabbing half tones. So an example of that would be that bulge right there. Right? We decided while we were drawing this that this shading on the bottom of that bulge isn't true shadow. Right, This is true shadow down here. 
So by leaving it out of true shadow, that makes it feel like it's just the whole tube is curving and then there's a slight bump out over it, but it doesn't bump out enough to completely block the light. That happens down here, right? Or on this bump. So that shadow is a conspicuous halftone, right? That's what it must be since it's not a uh, true shadow. So number two is the attention grabbing halftones. And you can see that really, if you take that rule, everything that I did on all these other bubbles and striations and stuff, these are really mostly attention grabbing halftones. Probably only this is true shadow, that is true shadow, and that is true shadow, right? Even that, I was thinking of that as a halftone. So you have to make those choices for yourself, right? But um, generally for this, I find more halftone, less true shadow tends to look more graceful, more realistic. So where light meets shadow, attention grabbing halftones, and then shading by the silhouette. So shading by the silhouette basically means um, it often gets handled by having darker lines on the other edge of your form, right? That tends to make it pop out, but it doesn't need to be this bold. That's why I filled this in real quick before we wrote down the contrast priorities. But generally uh, you can imagine if you were looking at a sphere and we had uh, our core shadow, let's say the, the light was kind of on our side of the sphere. So the light is coming from a bit in front of the sphere. So that's all shadow. The light becomes an ellipse on the sphere. Uh, we can, if we do an arrow in 3D, we can imagine the light is coming kind of from us, right? And uh, you can imagine if the light is hitting the sphere light um, most head on there, right? So if we were looking at, let's do this, do the same sphere, and now we're looking at where the light is, right? So the light on this sphere is somewhere there. That is where the light is hitting the sphere most directly, right? So we're seeing it somewhere here on the sphere. That means that if this is the most light part on this sphere, then technically, as the sphere gets to its edges, as it rolls away here to the silhouette, there should be darkening. right? Because that's lightest, so it has to get consistently darker all the way to the core shadow on the other side that we can't see. So there should be darkening on that silhouette of the sphere. Um, the trick is that most people exaggerate it. They will let that, they know that shading is there, they want to show that shading, and they will let it get almost as dark as, for example, the halftone shading that needs to happen down here by the core shadow, right? But when we look at this map, that makes it super clear. If, if the light is hitting there and we are seeing it from somewhere where the light is, somewhere around where the light is, um, it's crazy to have shading that dark on what would amount to here on the sphere, right? That should still be in the compressed area of the light. If we imagine the backside of the sphere, those halftone values are not happening till all the way over here, which we can't see at all. It's, way, it's on the other side of the sphere. So you need to keep that very light, but it is actually quite important, um, not nearly as important as any of this stuff, but it does become kind of important because as we showed, it does explain something about the light on the form that is useful, right? It is showing that something's rolling away, that it continues to be round Past, uh, past where it disappears in respect to our eye. So that winds up being number three for me. And by the way, this is a pretty classic um, order of contrast priorities. This is think this is maybe only um, this is maybe only one one step away from the classic uh, um, like classical drawing atelier contrast priority order, um, which you can find in certain books. Um, this is the one that I'm adding, really. I think if you take this out, this will be exactly the same order as um, the one used at the Repin Academy, for example. But where light meets a shadow, attention grabbing halftones, shading by the silhouette. So you can imagine, you know, getting a little bit of work 
right up there to make sure that those things feel like they continue to be round as they roll over. And then finally is, yep, all the way down here, shading in the compressed light zone. So that is the main part of the light, right? Everything that's going on in like this area of the sphere that should be in reality so compressed by the light. It is not, there's not enough exponential fall off of light up in these planes. Not, nothing going on in the true open compressed light should be as high contrast or as value changey as anything going on here, anything going on in these half, in these half tones as anything going on on the edge of the silhouette. This comes nearly last, the only thing below it is for is uh, stuff like reflected light. That should be lowest contrast of all. So this is a classic uh, contrast priority order. There are certain concessions that need to be made. This is assuming, this contrast priority order is assuming no preference for focal point or subject matter. I need to make that very clear. This is the contrast priorities of if you were just looking like at a white statue version of your subject and everything was the same value, right? It was all just white. The hair wasn't dark, the eyebrows, the eyelashes, they're all just made of marble, they're all white, right? This contrast priority list would work to represent your subject as such and make it feel round and formful. But you are going to change this order, you're gonna put move other things in and out as you make artistic decisions about focal point and about uh, subject matter. So for example, if, um, you know, I, th I'm leaving this broad because I don't wanna discuss, I don't wanna assume that you're drawing portraits, for example, right? The tentacle is like, whatever. It's, a, it's not a subject matter that really has any point on it that demands extra attention, right? But if you were doing a portrait, you have stuff like the eyes, the mouth, the eyebrows, these are very high contrast areas that demand attention and really sell the portrait. So for example, if we were making a contrast priorities list specifically for portraits, we might say that um, the contrast of the eyes, lips, and brows might actually go right after number one. So where light meets the shadow, if you do this without a careful delineation of how light meets shadow, um, these are gonna sit on nothing, right? They're just gonna look like eyes on a formless uh, face. Um, and also to draw these beautifully, to make them look good, they need to have carefully delineated variations in the areas where light meets shadow. So where light meets shadow would be first, but I do think the contrast of the eyes, lids, and brows would be more important than attention grabbing half tone shading by the silhouette like this must then take more contrast than anything below it here on the contrast priorities. So any subject matter is going to demand uh, certain changes to this. For example, if you were painting a car in sunlight, like a cool sports car with a really hot reflection of the sun on the hood, um, that reflection of the sun is a specular highlight that is occurring over or in the compressed area of the light. So then that would change this contrast priorities list completely. If you wanted to emphasize the highlight of that car, which a lot of people do in drawings and paintings of cars, you would actually need to move the shading in the compressed light in the compressed light zone way up on the contrast priorities list. And indeed, if you were doing a black car, which shows almost a black car shows very little form, it lives entirely on its reflections, then you would wind up moving number four up to near number one and maybe moving where light meets shadow down to like number three. So the subject matter can change the contrast priority list very severely, completely. And that's why it's priorities, right? It's a, you need to pick your priorities and you need to make artistic decisions about what is more important than what. But the main point here is that the decisions are up to you and that no matter what, they will wind up in an order. So you want to make a conscious decision about them. 
if you if you were to emphasize them all equally, your drawing wouldn't look like anything, right? Equal contrast is no contrast. Uh, if nothing is subordinated, everything's gonna pop out and then everything will wind up just white, just like blown out, black and white, burnt, it'll look bad. So you need to, no matter what, you're gonna need to give, every medium has a certain amount of contrast to give. So you're gonna have to give something the most contrast and then everything, you've swiped so much value range for that number one thing that everything else is gonna have to get less and less and less and less. It will always become uh, things that are being emphasized and things that are being subordinated. And that is a principle that is true across art. So you wanna keep that in mind and you want to note when you're moving between subject matters, you wanna be very aware of how that subject matter and what it demands. For example, the car. People love the highlights and reflections on cars. That really changes the importance of shading in the compressed light zone, right? So you wanna be, you wanna make good draftsmanship and artistic decisions based on what the subject matter demands are of the thing that you are drawing. In fact, I could even make a case for that for something like the tentacle because uh, if we wanted it to seem like uh, an octopus just pulled out of the water where it's really shiny and slimy, we really might want to emphasize um, the hot specular highlight, which would mean that we are going to darken way down everything in the light so that the specular highlight will pop off and have a lot of contrast. So that means that the shading in the compressed light zone is then going to get a huge area of the value range, right? It's going to get like probably more than half of the value range. And the shadows, the true shadows, are going to crunch down into basically nothing. No variation, nearly black, highly simplified. And they're going to get almost zero contrast to allow the light to hold together even while leaving room for a huge jump to a bright, shiny highlight. So that's what you want to keep in mind with the contrast priorities. And there is our new tentacle. Let's do a little bit, uh, let's put a, just real quick before we quit on this guy, let's just put a little bit of the effects that we had from the other demo. So darkening those core shadows, wherever they got boring from me smudging, I do this all the time, wherever a core shadow got boring from me smudging, as I go over it, I just redraw it, find a new interesting shape for it. Never let it die completely. You know, there's always an opportunity to make a shape that has gotten unexciting, there's always a chance to make it exciting again. That's really such a big part of what makes a, a drawing or a painting feel finished or good, you know? Like, look at some of your favorite pieces of art, zoom into them, and look at how uh, it's not just the whole thing that looks good. If you zoom in, every part looks good, you know? Even if it's simple and rough and um, or uh, very abstract, uh, the artist, I, I nine times out of 10, those parts that they left abstract and sort of impulsive and rough, uh, they left them beautifully rough. They left them beautifully impulsive. You know, they, they're very, um, those areas wind up becoming beautiful abstracts on their own. And uh, that contributes to the quality of a picture. It's like a picture hinges off of all of its parts, if any one part of it looks bad, that will always be a, a harm to the picture. And it also lives off of its overall impact, its overall composition and gestalt and the impact that it has from across a room, for example. So I'm darkening those two little dips there because like we were saying before, I decided that those are true shadow and that something like this is not. So I'm gonna soften that to make it get a little more half tony. And there's a lot of fun tricks you can play with the uh, with the stump here. I like to, um, as I go in through on this second pass, I like to uh, run a little circle around uh, some of the lighter areas to get extra subforms for free. It makes it look like there's a, like right before it gets to the light, it then blisters and bumps up again. If you exaggerate that, it can indeed look like a pimple or a blister and get really gross. And use your eraser to draw. It is one of the best tools. In fact, there's a lot of effects that can only be gotten with the eraser, or if you're stumped on an area, you can just kind of like scrawl over it with your eraser or get softer eraser shapes with a needed eraser. 
And then that will often give you ideas for really cool textures or effects. It's back and forth with this stuff. At this point, it becomes now that the shading is established, you know, the shading is probably not going to get looking much different from what we have here. This becomes, uh, this now becomes design questions. You know, where can I find um, a reason to do something different? Like maybe some repetitive dots instead of bubbles, right? So I could erase in and get a little texture there. Blend those guys back in and then go in there give them a little value. Something to add variety to the whole situation. Let them snake between some of those forms. As those dimples go closer to the true shadow, let them cast longer shadows because they're grazing ever more delicately into the shadow. The light is hitting them at sharper raking angles. That kind of helps you sell your lighting a lot. And yeah, you're just always looking for a different kind of surface to add, but those are design considerations, not really shading considerations. You can see whatever design choice you make, you drop it onto the form if you're doing it in the middle of the process like this, and then you just wrestle it into the contrast hierarchy, right? Make sure that it's dark enough where it's going into the true shadow. Let, it's, uh, let it get lighter as it's facing up towards the light. Knock back its contrast, knock back its contrast. Keep its edges soft if it's something that really doesn't fit uh, or doesn't earn, uh, doesn't earn popping out these little shapes haven't really earned the uh, earned sort of my attention enough to warrant them leaping out of the contrast priority. So when I put their little shadow shapes in underneath them, I want to make sure that those shadow shapes for those dimples are lighter than the core shadows down here in the areas that are turning into true shadow, so the darkest shadow. So these would actually just be indications of a halftone rolls away on those little dimples. The other thing that I did here that you can see slightly is I just took my uh, a sharp small eraser. This is a mono zero, which you can pick up at a lot of art stores. And um, the same way that I went with the stump earlier and followed the curvature of the tentacle to emphasize its form, I then did that with the, the removing tool, with the erasing tool. So I just went over and very lightly followed the direction of the form with the eraser. And don't be afraid to do this at any point in the process, even if you've done a bunch of work. I really like doing this on my drawings. It, um, it gives you interesting little striations and almost a little bit of like a skin texture looking effect. So you can see it gave me these little incident moments here, these little slashes over that shadow shape. So I'm just gonna react to them and extend them and turn them into like stretching skin over that spot. You can see that that adds like a natural dither, a bit of a natural looking surprise to that area. And that's what you want when you do this effect. And that's really the beauty of drawing with both your eraser and the pencil, right? It really lets you break up those shapes that got a little bit too artificial looking, right? A little bit too drawn. Just layering them lets you get a much more natural effect. And in graphite, the, la the layering is, is so fun and it often gives you uh, answers to difficult areas. You know, just don't be afraid when you've got something like this that is starting to look boring. So just go in with your erasers, even like this, even when you've got things going on this level, just uh, take your eraser and start cutting back into things. and react to what the eraser gave you because it's often unexpected and the unexpected really works in imaginative drawings. 
it tends to veer more towards reality. Just react to your racer and cut back and forth and create layering. The layering really uh, obfuscates your process and makes things look much more natural. Makes it look more like you uh, didn't make it up. Like, oh, whoa. what kind of references would produce these kinds of results? You know, that's just, you just pay attention to life and you know, life is surprising. So look for surprises in your imaginative drawings to make them feel more real. And then the back and forth would continue. And honestly, you know, this is too small for me to develop it much more uh, with a quick process like this. Something this small, you don't have that much leeway. So you want to go much slower, more careful if you want to get to a super resolved finish. But uh, then it's just back and forth. It's soften edges. Darken things down in the shadows as you make the lights more detailed so that the contrast hierarchy remains. And cut back and forth with your erasing tool to get new and interesting shapes. And you can go as far as you want adding details and they will sit correctly as long as no matter how far you go into adding those details, you respect the hierarchy that you have chosen. All right, let's move on.